Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. The radio and TV version of the show air in over 12 states. This includes both coasts and Silicon Valley. The show also airs in the UK, Caribbean, and Australia. For full show times, plus past episodes of the TV and radio show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. We just launched a free online community to connect past guests, listeners, and others. This community will allow you to network, chat on Slack, or get help with anything else, and a lot more. If you're interested in joining the community, buying some merch, sponsoring the show, or signing up for the newsletter, please go to buildingthefutureshow.com. The show is a proud media partner for the 11th Annual Media Excellence Awards, which are produced by Axis Entertainment in Los Angeles, California. The Media Excellence Awards are recognized as the most influential awards show, honoring innovation and leadership in all things mobile entertainment, lifestyle, and technology. For more information on how to submit to these awards, please visit MediaXAwards.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Lindsay Smalling. She's the Chief Executive Officer at SOCAP. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you guys are really doing at, at SOCAP is is actually quite innovative and interesting, and you guys are kind of expanding it a little bit this year. But maybe before we get into all that fun stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. I grew up in Los Gatos, California, about an hour south of San Francisco. Okay, very cool. Most people you meet um, that live in California were not born in California, so it's pretty cool that you were actually born in California. <laughs> yeah, and most people who are born in California stay because it's a, it's a lovely place to live, but I lived in New York for a little while and Boston for a little while, and I think um, made me really appreciate both coasts. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I actually love kind of all of California. I spent some time there. Um, more, mostly, I spent a, a bunch more time in LA than I have in kind of Northern California, but I, I love kind of the San Francisco, Silicon Valley area. I think it's it's beautiful. And it's obviously being in tech, um, you got to kind of appreciate it, right? Going to all the little campuses and just kind of the, the vibe just as you're kind of driving around or, or walking around. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting to grow up in Los Gatos because the first sort of Silicon Valley boom and then the dot-com boom and just watching that cycle year over year, um, you know, we're in sort of another one right now and just having the perspective to know it doesn't last forever. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. So you went to kind of university. What did you take in university and what made you take it? So I went to Pomona College in Southern California, and uh, going in, I had always been good at math and science, and so started off as a physics major, but then being at a liberal arts college was just blown away by all the other topics and ended up being a religious studies major, which um, surprised even me because I didn't grow up in a religious family, um, but was really just fascinated by how much that was a fundamental base of so much of, you know, world history, current sure. affairs, all of that and wanted to understand it better. No, I I, I can totally relate to that. Like I, one of my favorite classes, like I'm not a religious person. I don't really, if people are religious, that's fine. I'm just not and I didn't really grow up in it. It mm-hmm. kind of sounds like the same with you. But one of my favorite classes same, yeah. in high school was actually world religion. I find it absolutely fascinating. Like it, yeah, so I, I totally get that. But uh, so, Okay, so you took this. Um, what did you end up doing kind of after you graduated? Well, I didn't realize when I chose religious studies that for the next like two years, people would ask me if I wanted to become a nun, which was oh, the furthest thing from what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was a little bit lost after college, honestly. I followed some friends to the East Coast and in both Boston and New York because the um, financial sector is just so prominent. Sure. I ended up uh, working in first for a big institutional money manager in Boston um, and then for a mutual fund company in New York. And it really just, you know, I, I had no interest in finance, but then those were the jobs I got. And it really sort of showed me that Finance wasn't this this shallow sort of just transactional thing that I had perceived it as, but that so much of really long-term investment strategy and even short-term is about 
you know, what's happening in the world? Where do we think it's going? What are the repercussions of that? Um, and I also just got familiar with the language of finance, which is so opaque for so many people and doesn't need to be. It's really just sort of a different vocabulary around concepts that we all encounter in our day-to-day -day life. Interesting. Yeah, and I think having a background kind of in finance is never terrible no matter where you end up in life, right? Like understanding some of that stuff, I think selfishly, I wish I understood yeah. it better, right? Totally. And I'm always like in the various jobs I've had since um, have both taken the opportunity whenever there's sort of like, you know, when I moved back to the Bay Area and was in this venture capital culture, there's a whole other set of lingo here sure. that feels like, gosh, am I, am I just out of it? Or, do, you know, how am I supposed to learn this? And I'll just take someone out for drinks and say, you know, what is series A? Like, sure. what is an LP? <laughs> you know, yeah, no, fair enough. Get that sort of clarification. Um, and then I try to pass that along. So I've done some, I think, really helpful things with even our own employees at SoCap and said, you know, let me explain to you the difference between debt and equity. Let me explain to you the difference between private markets and public markets, because none of it is that complicated and it helps you in your personal finances, in understanding impact investing, um, as an entrepreneur, understanding the types of capital that might be appropriate for where you're at in your business. So I've really seen, I'm so grateful that I spent those few years in sort of traditional finance, um, just for getting my feet sort of grounded in, um, in that language and in the framework of finance. No, I 100% I agree. I think that's, that's quite fascinating. So you also went to Columbia University. Walk me through kind of why you decided to go there and what did you take? Um, so, yeah, so I, like I said, I was in Boston and New York in traditional finance, but had a sense sort of in my mid-20s that that wasn't what I wanted to do forever. And so um, realizing that the only people I knew on the East Coast really were sort of <laughs> in traditional finance, I moved back to the West Coast where I had a more diverse network um, of folks and ended up working in corporate social responsibility, Okay. Um, doing consulting with a lot of um early stage pre-IPO venture backed companies. So this was actually some venture capitalists who saw the way that eBay had set aside a set, a, a small percentage of their equity before they went public and created a foundation. And so when they went public, that foundation was instantly funded and it was relatively painless for the company to create a, a pretty sizable foundation. And so it was actually the venture capitalist who said, you know, this would be a great thing to do with more of our portfolio companies. Um, and so I started working with those portfolio companies around the things other than setting aside stock, like doing uh, some employee volunteer programs or other ways that they could build this charitable culture before they really had cash to give out because, you know, they were pre-IPO, they were still taking in cash usually. Sure. Um, so uh, that was really interesting, but then the market, you know, was crashing in 2008, and a lot of these companies were cutting programs um, because they were just, you know, super bare bones. The VC industry was going through its own sort of, you know, are we, will we survive uh, moment? And so then, I, I, you know, I just felt like I felt really drawn to this n new area that I was seeing where. Um, social entrepreneurship, the, the business was completely interlinked with the impact. And so in the case of a financial downturn, the impact couldn't just go away while you continued to produce the widget. Sure. But if you, you know, if you stopped producing the widget, the impact went away and vice versa. And so um, I decided to apply to business school because I thought I wanted to work in one of these early stage social enterprises and really wanted to understand all of those elements of operations, um, change management, finance uh, that a, I, you know, an MBA could offer. Um, and I would say that 
I, I'm often sort of the, the Debbie Downer around whether people should go to business school or not. Um, and not really specific to Columbia, but just because so much of this field, social enterprise, impact investing, uh, is really emergent right now. And you can learn so much from two years spent at any organization that's doing great work in this space that's much more relevant to sort of long-term success in this field than time at business school. And I think traditionally academic institutions are often uh, a little behind the leading edge. So practitioners make stuff happen, then academia studies it and sort of, um, you know, makes it consumable for lots more people and helps helps, uh, canonize the work that's already been done. So if you really are part of a leading edge industry, learning about it is by being in it more so than going to an academic institution. Um, but I did get all those basic pieces of an MBA and, uh, and then coming out of that, um, then moved back to the West coast and just jumped right in with, uh, both SOCAP and a group called impact assets, which is a financial services firm in the impact investing space. Very cool. So, that's interesting that you say kind of about business school. It, it, it's it's interesting because I think th- I've known people that have obviously gone and then not gone and have done just as well or become become really successful or not successful, you know, with or without kind of going to there. And I think a lot of it, to your point, is you can learn just as much kind of doing it on your own or, or kind of getting the experience obviously if you do it yourself you don't have the you know the the credit from a university or something but I, I think that's actually interesting that like somebody like yourself that actually went through it kind of says it's not necessarily for everyone yeah yeah I mean I guess it's it's really expensive sure and so depending on the career you're gonna have afterwards like how much of a burden is that debt gonna be is a really important thing to think about if you just volunteered for an organization for two years you'd be better off financially than sure. paying 50 grand a year or whatever well, um, fair enough. and then you know for certain industries like banking consulting and sort of corporate marketing they really are looking for MBA uh, candidates, right? But for most other things, there's a they're just looking for someone who can do the job, and so I think partly by uh, being willing to maybe take a little lower pay or um, be really flexible and open to contracts or a combination of different work, you can actually get your foot in the door sure. in an emerging industry like this much better. Yeah, that's interesting because if you take a little bit less and you don't have like say a student debt payment it might equal out to pretty close is is that maybe fair to say yeah and by the end of 2 years hopefully you've had a chance to renegotiate that salary a few times so that actually at when you would have completed a graduate program you are making what you might make out of a graduate program sure but you've proven your value to that organization and you've learned a lot i think that's really good advice so you, how did you kind of get involved with, um, you know, social capital markets, SOCAP? Um, you, you're now the CEO, but you didn't start off like that, correct? I didn't. Uh, it's not quite a, you know, mailroom to CEO story, but um, I started <laughs> out post MBA as the social entrepreneur coordinator. So okay. SOCAP has a wonderful tradition of. Uh, providing scholarships to outstanding social entrepreneurs to attend the conference. And uh, we, at this point, now scholarship about 150 social entrepreneurs every year. Wow, that's really great, actually. Yeah. And, you know, I think we really try to prioritize their participation. The ticket, you know, is anywhere from, uh, you know, $900 to $1,500, depending on when you buy it. And that's, pretty cost prohibitive for a lot of entrepreneurs, but their participation is so essential to just really that's where the rubber meets the road. You know, those are the folks out there creating enterprises, working in communities, um, advancing solutions. And so we need them to be there. So the social entrepreneur coordinator, uh, as you might imagine, gets 
a lot of emails leading up to SOCAP from 150 oh, yes. entrepreneurs who live in 45 different countries around <laughs> the world who are so excited about uh, their first SOCAP. So, I mean, it's a wonderful job. It's still a piece of SOCAP that totally has my heart and my attention. Um, but I did that for SOCAP 2012, SOCAP 12. Right. Um, and then the following year, Ended up, uh, we got a grant from the Packard Foundation to do some content around investing in oceans. Wow, very um, which cool. Which is a subject that I knew, yeah, I knew nothing about, but um, was fascinating to learn about sustainable fisheries and aquaculture and, uh, you know, reducing plastics in the ocean and so many different areas of both entrepreneurship and investment opportunity. Um, so that was my first foray into the a big chunk of content for SOCAP. And then in 2014, I took on all of the breakout content for the SOCAP conference, which we run about 140 breakout sessions with wow. over 500 speakers. Um, so then you're really cutting across all sectors, all industries. Um, I always feel like SOCAP is my the continuation of my liberal arts education because I learn about such a wide variety of topics every year. Sure. Um, and then in 2015 is when I really, you know, that my, my title wasn't CEO yet, but in many ways since 2015, I've been running, um, having sort of a, the, the tightest grip on the content. I see pretty much every piece of content that goes into the SOCAP program every year, but I also oversee the production and the marketing and the sponsorship, which we have amazing teams that really execute on all three of those, but um, I'm sort of that piece in the middle that makes sure it all works together. I, I think that's great. So for people that haven't heard of SOCAP, what exactly is it? And congrats on, you know, working your way up to the top. I think that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, Labor of love. So what I originally was drawn to about SOCAP was uh, how much it felt like the center of this really emerging universe sure. and around impact investing and social entrepreneurship. And I think at this point, pretty much everyone in the industry would agree that uh, SOCAP really is that most central largest gathering of the global impact ecosystem. So uh, last year was our 10 year anniversary. And Congrats, that's huge 3, actually. 3,000, yeah, yeah, it started in 2008. So we got through 10 of them. <laughs> um, and and at this point it's grown to about 3,000 attendees. Wow. Um, and our, you know, we touch a lot more people than that through newsletters and we do a year-round event series called SOCAP 365 that's in uh, cities around the United States. Um, we're launching a podcast to hopefully reach even more people. And all of that really speaks to our sort of core value of being the big tent for this field, that um, sort of our founder's vision was that uh, there were so many sort of siloed conversations where Foundations were talking to other foundations about doing impact investments. Uh, venture capitalists were talking to other venture capitalists about deals they were seeing that had tremendous social and environmental impact. Entrepreneurs were talking to other entrepreneurs, but that a true marketplace and the way to catalyze the growth of this field would be by bringing all of those players together. And that you really don't know uh, you know, so many events are designed around getting the right people in the room. Sure. And we believe that you don't know who the right people are to be in the room and that you really need to open the doors wide up. Um, and so, you know, that to me, taking, taking SOCAP and what we've built outside of, of a great annual flagship event is continuing that ethos of welcoming anyone into this space who is interested in that intersection of money and meaning and doesn't want to sort of live in this bifurcated world that that we're used to where you maximize profit at any expense in one part of your life and then you give charitably to create the world you want to see on the other side and that there's a way in between those where that's much more integrated where 
as you're doing business, as you're pursuing causes you care about, that you can do those together. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, the genesis of the social capital markets. And it really requires all of those players from the entrepreneurs to uh, high net worth individuals, institutional investors, fund managers, corporations, global NGOs, service providers in the space, academia, um, corporations are all a part of how we start to transition that two-pocket thinking into a much more blended approach to creating the world we want to live in. Interesting. So so people come to SOCAP. Um, it's October kind of 23rd and 26th in San Francisco. Beautiful area of San Francisco, actually. Um, but what can people kind of, like, what are the three days kind of like? I would say SOCAP is very festival-like. Okay. So it can be overwhelming, uh, just like a large music festival where sure. you feel like there's five stages you want to be at at the same time and um, so many people there that feel kind of like your people and how do you meet all of them. And um, But, you know, I would say longtime attendees of SOCAP, I think, find a nice balance where they pick a few sessions that they really want to get to because either they want to hear from that speaker or it's a topic they're really passionate about. They set some time ahead to meet with various people that they know are going to be there. And we have a great system to sort of um, allow all attendees to message each other and, and set up meetings. Um, Very cool. So it's really a blend of that. The, the content, we have a ton of content at SOCAP, but we also know that at any given time, only about 50% of people are sitting in sessions. The other 50% are sitting on picnic tables by the water, either talking about their next investment or a new partnership or, you know, it really feels like a very vibrant marketplace for those three days. Oh, that's that's awesome. I, I think that's that's really cool. And just even kind of on your homepage, you got like kind of some indoor, some outdoor space. Um food trucks, that kind of thing, right? So I, I think yep. I think the festival kind of thing is, is an interesting way to kind of sum, sum that up. Um, so I, I'm curious, though, to dive a little bit kind of deeper into um, maybe not necessarily um, exactly what's happening over in San Francisco, but kind of your whole vision for SOCAP, because you guys are, yes, you do this big kind of annual event, but you guys are doing so much more. You kind of mentioned um, other events. You also mentioned a podcast. Do you want to maybe dive a little bit deeper into some of that stuff? Yeah, definitely. So I think, um, you know, SOCAP got to be 10 years old and we all looked around and said, you know, we've really built this amazing brand that's sure. really well-known, well-respected and that has been, if not an entry point, sort of an important point in the evolution of so many individuals and organizations in this space, because they may have had enough of an idea that they were interested in impact investing and social entrepreneurship to get themselves to SOCAP. Right. But then SOCAP helped expose them to, if they were interested in empowering women and girls, that they could do that through... Um, through such a wide variety of offerings and how many other people were working in that space and have the chance to connect with those people and offer whatever was appropriate for them and, and then, you know, navigate new ways of partnering or um, engaging in that topic. And so what we found is that there, you know, we always knew that there were so many people who for perfectly good reasons were never going to make it out to San Francisco for three days, but that want to be part of this conversation. And so we took, uh, starting in 2015, we took SOCAP out on the road with SOCAP 365, uh, which has been run by my colleague Liz Maxwell since the very beginning. And together we just thought, you know, what's important for us as we take this out? And it was really, you know, continuing the conversation from SOCAP so that there were ways for people to reconnect on um, with their local community and 
uh, keep this conversation going year round, but also this piece of accessibility and welcoming new people into the conversation. And so these events are usually, say, a Tuesday night uh, after work, $15, $20 ticket price. And we do an hour long piece of content, usually very similar to one of the breakout sessions that you would see at SOCAP. Uh, And then we leave about an hour and a half for networking. And I think that what we've seen is we'll usually choose topics that are really relevant to a local audience. For example, um, an event on sustainable fashion in New York or an event on conservation in Berkeley, which there are a lot of people who care about those topics deeply, but don't necessarily know much about impact investing um, or about sort of the ways that these market-based approaches are, are really robust around these, um, around these issues. And so it, you know, we sort of draw people through various partners around that topic, through amazing speakers, um, into the room, we get about 75 to 100 people at each of these SOCAP 365 events. And about 70% of them are new to the SOCAP community. And so I think Liz has done an amazing job at really keeping what we, what we thought about originally, you know, how do we bring new people into the conversation? How do we help show people more around this intersection of, um, of the issues they care about and, and market-based solutions um, and so now over the last two years, we did about 20 of these events and wow. then we're doubling down this year and trying to do around 20 in just 2018 um, and expanding to new cities. Uh, we've done, we did one in Philadelphia this year, one in Seattle, and we're building um, a, a series with the team up in Seattle. We do, we've got an event coming up in Boulder, one in Austin. And so there's these great communities in all of these various cities and regions around the U.S. that are not quite as saturated as San Francisco or New York with, um, with conversations around impact investing. And so we're really excited about bringing new folks in through that. And then on top of that, we just knew we were doing these amazing pieces of content that uh, – you know, a hundred people were seeing in Philadelphia and wanted to expose that to even more people. So we've started recording those events, those live events, right. and are going to distribute those through a podcast. And uh, that podcast is called Money and Meaning. Very cool. And uh, we're also drawing out sort of a, a long time core value of SOCAP, which I sort of mentioned in the in our conversation around the big tent and you don't know who needs to be in the room but this idea of the valuable stranger and the way that bringing these diverse groups of people creates unlikely allies and so uh, alternating with those live events we're going to be interviewing unlikely allies in the SOCAP ecosystem partly to you know highlight different great organizations in this space but also to really talk through some of the amazing opportunities that come from new ways of partnering and collaborating and also the challenges that come from that. And I think that's all been part of building this marketplace, welcoming more people in, you know, even if you don't feel like know exactly how you fit yet, I think uh, these examples of, of unlikely allies will help encourage more people to join in in, in whatever uh, value they bring. No, I, I think that's really great. I, I'm curious, though, you mentioned impact investing, and I, I think people kind of understand what that kind of means at this point. But do you maybe want to kind of just what does it mean to you? And then why? Because I, I think generally people don't really want to maybe like screw up the planet or maybe try to actually be good and, and maybe give back. But I, I think they maybe they just don't know how. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. And I think um, I probably did gloss over the term impact investing a little bit. So uh, the term impact investing, is this is actually sort of a cocktail party tidbit, but okay. it was, you know, we know the time and the place when that term was coined. So the Rockefeller uh, Foundation convened a group of folks in 2008 
uh, at their Bellagio Center to say, you know, we see all of these different ways that um, uh, different types of investors and entrepreneurs are find, aligning their values with their investments or aligning these social and environmental issues with the way they're investing and really truly investing. So uh, meaning that you get at least a return of your principal um, and some appropriate amount of return above that. So right. that this isn't philanthropic capital, um, but it is investment capital often supported by other philanthropic efforts, you know, that sort of lay the way for this investment to happen. Um, but that, that was a really powerful tool because we've seen the ways that markets have their own momentum and their own sort of flywheel because if you can find a way to sell a product or service that people, that a consumer really wants, that's much more sustainable than um, something that's, that's grant supported or that a nonprofit is delivering. Um, and that if you can find ways to really tap into that market, that, uh, that those solutions can be distributed much more widely and have tremendous impact. And so they gathered folks together and, and sort of created this umbrella of impact investing as a way to gather momentum and movement around this idea of how do we tap into market-based solutions. And, um, and so the field has grown tremendously since then. Um, there's a lot of uh, reports out there on um, sort of the industry association for impact investing is called the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, and there's uh, wonderful resources there. Um, there was a really early report that was done by uh, the GIN and the Monitor Institute that was just updated this year um, around the state of the field and sort of what needs to happen next. So. All of this is, is relatively new um, in the sense that, you know, the last 10 years have really been the evolution of this market. Um, but it's, people have been doing impact investing for a lot longer in the sure. sense that, uh, you know, there was like uh, divestment during apartheid or, you know, other ways that people have said, I want to make sure that my money isn't going towards things that I'm really opposed to in the world. Um, and so when we talk about impact investing at SOCAP, we really do take a very broad approach. So um, there's, as I mentioned, there's sort of public markets and private markets. Um, the history of impact investing is more in those private markets where you can make direct investment into enterprises that are doing, um, that are creating positive social and environmental impact. But the term impact investing has now sort of grown to also to really um, be a lens across all asset classes. So in the public market, so like the stock market, um, when you think of an impact lens on the public market is are those companies uh, that you're potentially investing in considering the environmental factors around their business, the social factors and governance factors. And so a lot of fund managers that work in those public markets are now applying these ESG, environmental social governance filters, to the ways that they're evaluating companies. And this isn't just to, you know, as you said, do good or, or not do so much bad, but partly they, they're just seeing the ways that that makes for a better company. You know, sure. it really does have these investment repercussions. So, um so you can really take an impact lens to any type of investment. Even um, one of the ones that, like you said, people don't know how to engage. One, you know, I'm, I'm not a wealthy person. And so for a lot of years, even though I was passionate about this, I, I wasn't necessarily engaged. I had ways that through my 401k, I could uh, ask if there were um, ESG screened funds that were available to me through my retirement fund. Um, but one that I got really excited about was my bank. So where was my cash? And uh, as, as I sometimes say, like, what was it doing while I was sleeping at night? Sure. And there's actually a really easy choice there between if your money is at a community bank or a cooperative bank, you have a much closer sense of what 
they're taking your deposits and where those are loaning out to support community businesses, small businesses in your area. Um, and so I think finding those options where you just are a lot closer to what you're, uh, that you actually know what's in your portfolio or you know sort of where your cash is sitting. Um, those are steps that we can all take. And I think you've seen the ways that consumers have really shifted around this where they've just taken a much more proactive stance around where is my food coming from? Sure. Was, where, was this clothing ethically made? And so there are ways that consumers are already shifting into that more sort of thoughtful um, engaged, intentional mindset around the work their money is doing in the world. Um, and I think because finance is so opaque to so many people, it's sort of like the last frontier for a lot of the you know, general public. Um, but it, it, it's coming, and I think partly it's, uh, it's a lot of the conversation at SOCAP in, in this industry is how do we make it more accessible? How do we create products? that are not just for ultra high net worth individuals that are for, you know, the average person who's looking to, you know, whether they're, you know, investing in a CD or they're, um, or they're having, you know, choosing a different place to put their bank account. How can they understand what the impact of that choice is? No, I, I think that's actually really interesting. And I was reading an article a while ago about like, um, certain oil companies, for example, were having a real trouble um, recruiting kind of um, younger kind of people because, well, we all know how, you know, the oil industry has kind of pollute, been polluting the planet, right? And so they've been really mm -hmm. trying to put out there more like, you know, we're giving back here and there and, and trying to do all these things to kind of recruit people that are, you know, maybe a little bit more skeptical or kind of younger um, because of history and kind of the whole thing around kind of that industry. But I, but I think even just having those types of people um, maybe f that maybe don't understand coming to either um, SOCAP in, in San Francisco or some of your other events, just to understand how they can maybe become more of a greener company or, you know, network or and meet somebody that could potentially help them, right? Because I think... A lot of companies nowadays um, could potentially maybe hire somebody or acquire somebody to help their kind of maybe large organization actually become um, a lot more caring about what's happening kind of with their company kind of globally. Is, is that kind of a fair thing to say? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it is challenging for really large companies because this, you know, what we're talking about is a really integrated, like, how are you providing value in the world to your consumers, to society? How are you treating your supply chain correctly? How are you really accounting for the negative externalities? That's a big shift for sure. companies that haven't been asked to do any of that for a long time. And so I think some of the really... Um, inspiring examples are sort of small to mid-sized companies. Okay. Um, you may have heard of the B Corp movement. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. B Lab, so for benefit, um, where they just said, you know, let's really make this part of the, both the way that a company can be incorporated. So rather than an S Corp or a, um, a C Corp, creating the actual B Corp certification that says we aren't just here to maximize profit we will maximize profits while considering environmental and social, you know, implications of our company. And then for those that are already incorporated and can't do that, they have the B Corp certification, which is sort of like the good housekeeping award or lead certification where they, um, companies can say, here's all the things we do to treat our employees, right. To consider our supply chain. And there's a really rigorous certification process there. Um, and there are some large companies that are going through that process and becoming B Corp certified, which is amazing. Um, but I think partly just the realities of being a massive entrenched company being versus being a company that's um, creating their culture and their standards and their practices and doing it right from the start. Um, and then I should mention, we're also, um, SOCAP recently uh, sort of 
became part of a family of brands that includes a group called Conscious Company Media. Sure. Um, and Conscious Company has had a print magazine for the last uh, few years that really highlights the work that these companies that are considering all of their stakeholders, their employees, their uh, suppliers, their consumers, and the broader world, um, they highlight a lot of amazing stories. So I think this piece around business and consumers is oftentimes a much more accessible place, but it's it's the same conversation around how do I not just sort of divide these things in my head and do good over here and think about, you know, bottom line and business over here. That that doesn't serve any of us because we end up working sort of at cross purposes with ourselves. No, I, I 100% agree. And I actually had uh, Megan on the show a couple of months ago, and it was interesting to talk about kind of her journey, kind of starting the, the magazine and, and everything. And it, it was interesting because you're right, like they basically shot really high. They got like the CEO of Whole Foods on on the first cover of their magazine. And we talk about how she kind of got made that happen. And it, it's quite fascinating, right, that you guys are kind of either partnering with or, or building these kind of, um, you know, brands that are kind of are throughout North America and, and, you know, kind of beyond just through people coming to the, this main kind of conference. I, I think it's actually quite interesting because I think a lot of people um, want to do it, but don't know where to start. Right. And having a community like you guys have kind of built and you're doing these events in maybe smaller cities is kind of the wrong maybe term for it, but cities that aren't necessarily maybe have these big communities like some of the bigger cities in, in, in America. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's really, um, it's sort of in the zeitgeist right now. Maybe that's the bubble I sit in, but I feel like you can see it in the media. The sure. way more of these conversations are sort of like, you can't separate these two things. And I think you sort of mentioned, um, that more of the millennial generation and others are really thinking about this in the jobs that they take. And that's a trend that the impact investing community has been watching as well, that millennials really care much more to know where their money is going. And that's not because they have, you know, bigger hearts than the generations before them or that they are, you know, careless with their money or something like that. But sure. I think it's really interesting to think of the combination of factors that like they grew up partly in a much more globalized world where sure. stories around sweatshops were yeah. front and center and, you know, the Enron story. And, yeah. you know, you can't, you couldn't get away from a lot of this stuff where it's like, yeah, if you're, a jerky person, like you run a bad business yep. <laughs> and you know, if you do things that are unfair to other people, that's going to come around and bite you eventually. And so I think they grew up with that. They also grew up with, you know, recycling and yeah. Earth Day and a lot of those factors. And then they lived through the financial crash of 2008, which I think really undermined a lot of these things that hadn't been questioned for a few decades around like, this is just the way the market works. This is the way everyone should set up their portfolio. You can't, you know, there's no free lunch. So if you want impact, you're going to concede returns. And that's just the way it is. And it sort of was like, didn't we just concede a bunch of returns by following business as usual? You know, it's sort of like whatever that sacred cow was around <laughs> uh, just maximize the bottom line that doesn't really hold true for the generation that was just coming into their professional life and their investment life as that market crashed. And so it's an opportunity to say there is a different way to do this and we need to re-examine our assumptions. And there are implications to our planet, to our you know finances, to our happiness if we don't think about these things in a more integrated way. Yeah, and I think even just with the internet, right? You, like a lot of millennials or, or the younger generation, um, I can't, the name escapes me off the top of my head, but uh, like you, there's so much information. You can basically get everything at, you know, your fingertips, right? Like most people nowadays have a smartphone. Um, I think kind of younger generations, especially, they might not even have like a computer. They might just have a tablet 
or or a phone, right? Um, so mm-hmm. it, it's interesting, right? Where some of the old, like I re- I'm 35, just so you have some context. Like I remember before the internet, but like there's a lot of people nowadays that can't say <laughs> that, right? Like it's wild, right? So it, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So I, I'm curious though, um, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So let's maybe close with mentioning where people can kind of get more information about all the stuff you guys are doing at SOCAP and, and kind of all the events um, throughout kind of the nation and, and beyond. Um, do you maybe kind of want to give us like a quick couple minute recap of all the stuff you guys are doing and, and where people can get more information about all that stuff? That would be great. Yeah. So um, the flagship event, as you mentioned, is October 23rd through 26th in San Francisco. And uh, you can find out more about that as well as our SOCAP 365 events. Uh, you can join our newsletter, um, all of that at socialcapitalmarkets.net. Um, and then I would also encourage um, our Twitter account is very active, which is at SOCAP Markets. Um, we have an Instagram account. You can find us on Facebook. There's a large LinkedIn community uh, that has a lot of the various players in this space. Um, I think mostly just letting people know that if this is something you're interested in, there is this really amazing, generous, collaborative community that's doing this work. And once you plug in, which SOCAP is a great way to do that, um, we can help you find all the other people that uh, that you want to meet, that you may not know you need to meet, um, and that you know this community is growing really, really quickly. Um, so SOCAP is a great place to to start and jump in. Sure. And you mentioned that you usually get a few thousand people at, at SOCAP. Is, is that correct? Yep. Uh, it's grown to be about 3,000 people. Wow. We probably won't get too much bigger than that okay. um, at the annual event, but hopefully through some of these SOCAP 365 events uh, and and other offerings, we can reach an even broader audience and in whatever sort of way that they're looking to engage. Sure. And I, I think that's what's um, what I find kind of really fascinating about kind of what you guys are doing is, you know, like there could be somebody in a small town or maybe in a big city that just doesn't know where to kind of start. And I think either coming to your event or going to one of your smaller kind of 365 events um, can maybe meet the people that that have kind of done it or are doing it. Because I think part of the problem that some people have sometimes is they just don't know where to start, right? Or they have a question Absolutely. or they're stuck on something um, and they're like, okay, well, you had a similar problem. How did you solve that, right? And I think, yeah, you could probably Google around or spend a bunch of time on LinkedIn. But, you know, sometimes just meeting somebody in person or getting connected through some somebody like, um, you know, or something like SOCAP that – it kind of gets their ball rolling, right? Where, um, Mm -hmm. you know, they can maybe end up meeting that person at SOCAP that they've been kind of talking to online for, for maybe months where some people sometimes I find are intimidated to go to events if they're just kind of starting out. But if they kind of know somebody that they met online or at a smaller event to go to the bigger event, they can, you know, potentially end up meeting a bunch more people through a connection that they made online, right? And I think the more and more you kind of get, put yourself out there and, and network and go to these events if you're in kind of the space or, or looking to get into the space, you'll be better off, right? And I, I think that's really great what you guys are doing. Yeah, well, and it's, you know, I think this is probably true of most industries, but there really have been so many amazing reports and resource guides and there's membership organizations and other things that, that people can connect to, but it's sort of like, until you have that first touch point where that all gets unlocked for you and you sort of see, oh, this is all here, it feels really hard to access. And so um, as much as we can help people find find that first, like, I really want to learn more about local place-based investing. Great. Sure. There's a whole set of resources. Let's direct you there. I really want to learn about investing in women and girls. Wonderful. There, here's the organizations you should know about. And that's what I really think our value can be as that sort of central platform is that um, we don't need to collect all the resources in one place, but just helping people find what their passion is and what they're really looking for um, could help 
so much more happen in this space and this market accelerates so much more quickly. No, I 100% agree with you. Um, and, and I guess one more time, it's just socialcapitalmarkets.net. Um, you guys kind of have the agenda and all the stuff that's happening. And then all your different events um, kind of listed there. So people can go kind of check that out. But uh, Lindsay, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Wonderful. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks very much. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. To join the free community, buy some merch, sponsor the show, or sign up for the newsletter, please visit the website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.